August Falta Hey Clark Community Focus. Hello and welcome to the Community Focus program. This program is sponsored by Eason's of Main Street Cavan and Pear Street Mullingar. This program highlights the work of community groups in County Cavan and the contribution that they make locally. If you would like to comment on the show or have your community initiative or issue featured, please email drumlinmedia at gmail.com or contact us via our Facebook or Twitter pages. The show is live on the internet every Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock and is also live on Smith's Cable Vision in Cavan Town. On tonight's show, I'll be discussing two books that have recently been produced in Cavan. A book covering the history of Cavan for 400 years, Cavan Town, 1610 to 2010, a brief history, has just recently been launched. And joining me now in studio to talk about it is Brenton Scott and Brian Hora. That's you're very welcome here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate you coming in. Glad to be here. Fabulous book. Thank you. Looks really, really well. And um, Brian, you're responsible for. Brian. Well, Brendan, you're rather you're responsible for editing. Well, I I edited the book, but Brian, mm-hmm. who's the town clerk, uh, came to me last year, mm-hmm. saying that the town council wanted to mark four hundred years since the charter uh, had been signed for the town, and so I put together a series of lectures which ran from about September last year to March this year, and then edited those lectures into the articles that are there now. Very good. So it was a town council initiative? Yes, it was. We, I suppose we were aware and conscious that the, the anniversary of the signing of the town charter um, was, was coming up, and um, what we wanted to do was to, to create something that would mark that. And um, yeah. other towns around the country had, had similar um, celebrations that, that they'd done. But none had produced a book like what we had produced, and what we wanted to do was to create something which would not only be a reflection back on the history of the town, but would also create something that would be there in the future for people to, to have a record of, because mm-hmm. history is important. Absolutely. And it's, yeah. but the, what's in the book, um, it's only a snapshot of the history of the town, but it's important that we don't lose that history and that we remember mm-hmm. things that happened in the past. So we're, we're delighted with the way that it's turned out, mm-hmm. and um, it's, a, it's a very good publication. Absolutely. I mean, it is makes very, very interesting reading. I've only just had a quick flick through, but I've been fascinated too by some of the stories that you've been telling me mm-hmm. that w- that are um, within the book. Um, particular the fact that Calvin was burned four times. Did you say uh, three? Anyway, mm-hmm. it was it was burned. Uh, the town was set up around the monastery, the 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 friaries. Uh, down on 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 Abbey Street, um, right. yeah. and it it was set up around thirteen hundred, and the town that was I suppose a sort of centre point for the town at that time, and the town was burnt down at one stage uh, by a monk who had been drinking, and he fell asleep, knocked <laughs> over a candle, and burned the the abbey down, and then burned down everything else that was around it as well, and then it was burnt down again in the late sixteenth century by a wife of the O'Reilly chief, who had some mental problems, and she burned the town down as well, and then it got burned again in sixteen ninety. There was a battle around the time of the Williamite Jacobite wars, and uh, the town got burned again at that stage, but it keeps coming back, you know. So it's great. Yeah, well, hopefully it's not going to happen again. <laughs> no, 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 we'll, we'll try not to. We'll, we'll try and avoid that now. And is there any other interesting facts that you uncovered within the... Uh, yeah, well, there, there's a lot of... There's an, ar- an article in it about uh, the workhouse, which was mm-hmm. uh, St. Phelan's uh, nursing home, the, as I remember it, uh, just yeah. out the road. And, you know, some of the stories about people who were in there, you know, and the situation that they found themselves in, even not around the time of the famine, but, you know, after that as well, uh, you know, people, people sort of think, you know, the famine, that was it, you know, like that was the hard time and everything mm-hmm. else was relatively all right, but it wasn't really, you know. And a lot of people suffered terribly and a lot of people mm-hmm. would do anything they could to stay out of the workhouse the whole idea of a workhouse was let's make it as awful as possible for people so because the irish are naturally lazy this is was the english mentality uh, that, that the irish are so naturally lazy that um if we give them anything they'll take that and run with it and um so let's make the workhouse as terrible as possible a place to be but never like no ma- no matter how bad the workhouse was um people irish people did not want to go into them because it was a social thing god you know did you hear so and so went to the workhouse you know no one wanted to go near them no matter how good or bad they were but despite how bad they were uh, they still saved 
a lot of people's lives. A lot of people who would have died otherwise uh, were saved uh, because of the workhouse. And so many still had to go in. And so Why many still had to go in. Time. I mean, I remember uh, my grandfather, uh, when I was dead over 20 years now, uh, but he was in that home uh, and we used to go, you know, see him and that. And I remember my brother and I would be playing out the back uh, mm. around where the graves were and you could see bits of bones sticking out of the ground I mean they were very shallow the graves, graves yeah. you know at the time and we didn't really know what it was but that's mm. that's what it was I mean they've since reconsecrated the graveyard and that but uh, you know it was it was a rough a rough place now you know and does the book does it that chapter detail any of the individual stories or well it it, it talks it went there yeah 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 it, it talks about the people who went there and why they went there and why other people didn't go there and all that sort of thing. So it's it's a very interesting chapter, that one. I liked, I liked uh, going through that one. So it was, mm-hmm. The great thing for me was editing the book. Uh, I was learning stuff going along, you know, because yeah. people were sending those essays in to me. So I'd be going, oh, I didn't know that, you know, and I'd be going through them. And so it was great. So hopefully people will get something similar out of it as well, you know. And did you have a, a call to ask people to submit information or? Uh, well, no, we we basically went with um, with I I knew a number of people who I knew could do the job mm-hmm. and I asked them to do it and uh, they were so good you know because I put them under a lot of pressure and uh, they were really good worked very well and didn't complain and weren't you know mean about it or anything and you know because I did work them hard uh, to get to get the book done you as quickly as possible and, yeah. yeah we had a deadline and we had to meet it and uh, people worked really well to it you know so thank god for them so it's, it's good at mountain and a lot of interesting chapters in it for something that you said you just started work on last september i know some of the information you know was already there and you're editing it but yeah it's certainly it was the quickest turnaround of a book that i've ever done from from sort of from there to getting it out Mm -hmm. the last uh, we were saying beforehand the last lecture was in march March, and the book was launched two weeks ago so it was very it was quick turnaround. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was persecuting poor Brian. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I needed a couple of names of um, of town clerks. Was town, town clerks and town, town managers. Town managers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Brian, Brian, Brian's wife was in labour, I think. And, and, and I was <laughs> texting him, going, uh, have, you got these, have you got these names yet, please? <laughs> I'm sure she felt like taking that phone. And yeah, <laughs> I'm sure Brian felt like taking yeah. the <laughs> phone and throwing it. Labour war, trying to reply back to messages and trying to rent I know, God, lo- which I didn't realise. I was mortified when I found out afterwards, you know. But he took it very well. He took it very well. Uh, I used to give me a chance to step out as well for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, you, you obviously contributed to, to it then mm. in terms of the g- given the details from the town council's yes. perspective. Yes. I know there's um, me- uh, minutes of meetings and... There are. There's um, extracts there? from the what would have been the Urban District Council uh, meetings. Uh, it's now the town council meetings. Um, over the last 110 years mm-hmm. and um, what's what's inter- interesting when you look back at the, the extracts is how you can see things that happened in the past and, and relate them to the present and um, I'll just give you one particular example mm-hmm. now it's not going back that far it's going back to 2007 when the late councillor Veronica Sharkey was on the council and she informed the members that the Tidy Towns Committee had some funding set aside to do a development at the Green Lock on the Dublin Road mm-hmm. and um, the, the contract is actually on site at the moment um, carrying out that project so you can you can kind of trace it from when it was raised first at the town council meeting back then to the actual work being happening now as well so you can it's, it's kind of a nice link between the present and the past mm-hmm. there as well what's also interesting in it and brendan alluded to it there was the, the, the pictures in it yeah and um there's one particular picture of the the market house it's on page 72 and um you can see in front of the market house it's kind of mm concrete bollards is probably the best way to describe them they were all taken out and removed when the, the building was was taken down you can probably just show it up to the back of yeah. the front here see yeah. yeah you can see it on page 72 you see these um small bollards here just in the front of it yeah and um, only in the last couple of months somebody contacted us to say they had two of them and yeah. um, we're looking at maybe some way of trying to incorporate them back into the townscape yeah maybe not on the market square if we can't fit them in there, but certainly we'd like to reintroduce them at some point now. Because how does somebody end up with two history. bollards from the town? I don't know, but there's, there's a lot of history associated with those as well. So we're doing some research on that at the moment as well, trying and get the, the history on it, particularly regard to people that would have maybe would have been seen sitting on them or would have been kind of linked with them or associated yeah. with them in some way. 
Um, so there's a, a lot of very, very interesting information in here. Mm, and, absolutely. Um, it's, um, I think it's a, a fitting tribute to the history of the town. Yeah, and it was yeah. lovely to do something like this to mark the 400 years. Well, the ex the exactly, charter, that, so. that's what we really wanted to achieve. Mm. A lot of other towns that had similar celebrations had done flags and bunting and mm. and maybe had kind of, um, I won't say parties, but kind of festivals and things like that to mark something the occasion. Gone. And Again, you lose the impact yeah. of it and it's gone. Whereas this, mm -hmm. we have something that will be here forever. Absolutely. Yeah. And photographs, collection of photographs that you have in it, yeah. um, where did you get all yeah, the photographs uh, from? Well, there were really two sources. Uh, Father Liam Kelly, who wrote the article about old photographs in Cabin Town, mm -hmm. he's got a great collection of photographs uh, and he gave gave us a load of the photographs and what he did which was really nice he was able to link up reports from the newspaper from the Celt with photographs uh, that are in the book so he was talking about there's a photograph in it uh, marking the coronation of George V uh, outside the courthouse and he was able to link that back then to the report in the Anglo Celt where it says that it was it was a miserable day, very wet, and if you see the photograph, you can see the the rain on the ground, you can see the shine from from the wet ground. Mm -hmm. uh, he's talk there's there's a photograph taken, somewhere from around here, I would say maybe just a couple of yards uh, towards uh, the centre of the town, uh, mm -hmm. showing a couple of guards walking across the street with bicycles, and. Uh, Father Liam was able. There's a, a a banner across the street, and he was able to find out around uh, he couldn't just read the date of the banner but he was able to find out through uh, newspaper reports it was uh, i think it was uh, an aoh uh, day out to bundorn it, it was like 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 the boys jolly going up to bundorn and uh, so he was able to figure out a date for it and then yeah. from there date all of the photographs that were taken by this one company to a particular week in a particular month, in a particular year. Uh, so it was a great bit of work he did to get that. The other photographs came from, uh, mostly came from a guy called Dermot Walsh, who's from town here, has lived his life in Cavan Town. He's a great collection of photographs. And one of the photographs he gave me, which is lovely, shows the two cathedrals, the two Catholic cathedrals, um, side by side. The cathedral that's there now was built in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, the original cathedral was right down on the road, a little small one. They knocked it down and brought it out and rebuilt it in Bally Hayes. But they have the two cathedrals side by side in this one photograph. And I'd never seen it before and I was delighted to see that as well. Brilliant. So I said, that's going in. So, Fantastic. Listen, guys, um, great work has gone into it. And it really is a very, very good book. Um, where can people get a copy of it? How much is it? Um, it is twelve fifty, and it can be bought in all the local bookstores in town: uh, Crano Bookshop, uh, Eason's, uh, Cabin Genealogy, the Tourism Centre as well. And I think you were saying, Brian, it'll be in the flash shop as well. It'll be on sale in the flash shop as well during the flash when that's on in August. Perfect. Yeah. Well, it probably would be very popular. I would say with tourists during the flash. I hope so. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great read. I think we're going to have a competition. Mm -hmm. for a copy one copy of the book on facebook copy, yes. yeah. our facebook page la later on so we'll come up with a co uh, question for that and we'll put it up on our facebook yeah. page thanks okay. very much for coming That's in all, thank you we really enjoyed having you here thank you. cheers and the best of luck thank, thank you very, very much, much. Thank you. cheers now earlier on today cavan tv caught up with ryan tuberty um when he was in the cavan crystal hotel Good morning, I'm now joined by Ryan Tupperty, the one and only. Well, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, you were down here for the Eastern Spelling Bee competition, yes. so how's your spelling coming along? Uh, spelling is coming along fine. Uh, I would rather be asking the children how to spell than being a child being asked how to spell, because honestly, some of those words are just a horror show. Um, mm -hmm. And especially you know, when you're asked to do such a thing in such a public forum, it's, it's nerve-wracking. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm um, in awe of, of them, honestly, all around the country we've met these kids and they've just been great. I think that the, uh, the future, yeah, in terms of intellect and, uh, and kind of education, mm -hmm. is pretty safe, actually. So good. And a cabin boy it's won the prize today. Which is fantastic. Yeah, it's <laughs> guys delighted for him. You know, it's nice to have the local guy win. Obviously, it's... Uh, he won the Ulster final He today. won the Ulster final today, and uh, it was great. Because, you know, it's always nicer when we're sitting here and the little fella from cabin wins. So good on him, yeah. Yeah, um, of course, he'd have all the local support here today as well. He would have had the local support, yes. And I know you had a, a good array of music here mm, mm. Um, today. You had the Stripes. Yeah. And Martin Donahue from the yeah, Fla, yeah. which has been launched on, on tomorrow night evening. Good. And um, yeah. So what do you? And of course you had the, uh, the Bugle Babes well, that we just interviewed. I've got a kind of, kind of retro feel. I think I was born in the wrong 
time. I should have been born probably pretty much when the Bugle Babes uh, were around if the first time around. And mm -hmm. equally, I would have liked to have been around when the likes of uh, the Righteous Brothers and the Beatles and the Animals and so on were around. So to have the Bugle Babes and the Stripes here is like me being in musical fantasy island, you know, where mm -hmm. that music is still there. But they're great. And of course, I love the Stripes. I mean, they came on the toy show. They, blew Fantastic. us away and we've adopted them as our kind of pet band you know we want them to do really well on the radio and the TV we, we, as I, we all do yeah well I, yeah. I think to promote them I love the idea of young guys looking good and you know doing um, playing instruments you know uh, mm -hmm. as well so it's great I think they're going to be great yeah I really hope they go far and what about the flat music? Yeah, I love the flat music yeah. too. I don't get me have wrong. Have you ever been to the flat before? I have not been to the flat. I've been up. You'll have to come this year, will you? I'd like to come this year in August. Great. You see, because yeah. uh, and Martin was telling me come up and we'll have a look at his new CD and all that sort of. And I'd love to because I love traditional music. I don't mm -hmm. play it, um, but if when I'm driving across the west of Ireland uh, in my car, I'll always bang on some traditional music because mm -hmm. it gets me in the mood. Uh, mm. you know to enjoy the west and everything so yeah I'd love to come back I would love to come back be great I personally was never at a flat until I came to Cavan okay, so and I, I think they're brilliant the yeah. atmosphere is just unbelievable in the town I think it's elect the electric picnic with fiddles yeah so let's go for it absolutely so we'll have you back here around yeah, the, between the 10th and the 20th of August God help you you may well see me uh, rampaging on the streets of Cavan fantastic we'd love it oh listen thank you <laughs> great thanks a million Ryan what a pleasure thanks for having me on welcome back and we're all about books tonight because another book which will be launched tomorrow night is a book on, Tom, on Thomas James Barron. And here to tell us more about the book, we have Jonathan Smith Hello, from Cavan, Cavan Town Library. Cavan County Library, that's yes. Right. Jonathan, you're very that's welcome amazing. here this evening. Um, this is a, a book about a man from Cavan um, who was quite, correct, yeah. quite was a character and... He was, he was, yeah. He was, he was a native of uh, Knockbride. He was uh, born in 1903 and died in 1992. And I think during that, that period of life, he, he achieved a massive uh, amount of uh, things regarding local history. So, I mean, like, um, Tom He's very Brown, interested in local history. He was, oh, yeah, it was, it was his whole thing, really. Um, he was an actual school teacher. He taught uh, at Knockbride and then went to the model school in Ballybor. I suppose the, the, the really central thing that, that he discovered was the uh, Corlec head, uh, tree faced head, trisphalic head. And um, what happened was the, the head was on the pier of a gate. And I suppose right. he identified it as um, it was an early I iron. I think age. we have an image of that if yeah, we, we, we can. The, Dave will bring it up. That, that's it there. Yeah. That's, that's correct. It was an early iron age. And um, it would sit on this gatehead, and it was basically people throwing children, pegging stones at it and that. And right. uh, he decided then that, uh, well, basically he, he was going to do something about it. So he got in touch with the National Museum, mm -hmm. and they came forward, and uh, it was owned privately at the time, so he negotiated it and got it into the museum. And it's got a prominent position there uh, to this day, so it has. And so is that still in the museum? Still, still in the still museum, in the so it is. I think we have an image actually of, of the man himself, Thomas yeah, Barron, yeah. that we bring up. That's that that's him there in 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 in, in the later the, the years. Latter years yeah. Funny enough, he used to wear these very dark sort of rimmed glasses. And when I was researching the book, my son said to me, he says, uh, he says, Daddy, he says, why are you looking at Harry Hill? <laughs> <laughs> he took it into his head, you know, with the the glasses. Yeah. But um, I suppose just getting back to the the, the book, um. I think I mean like he really deserved he really deserved to have something done on him you know because um, uh, when you think of the the the, 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 the tree faced head mm -hmm. and uh, I mean like uh, I suppose like he had um, uh, his, his involvement then with the museum Doctor Maher actually he had great faith in him and Doctor Maher asked would he excavate some of the Cranogs in Knockbride. And so he set out to do that. He wasn't a qualified He wasn't qualified, no, no. Initially, they had somebody there to sort of assist. Mm -hmm. But then he got going on it. And, uh, he was quite self-taught. Self-taught. And he used uh, a grid system, uh, which was set up by Mortimer Wheeler. And he basically cut the Cranog out into grids and uh, excavated. And he sent these big box loads of uh, material up to the museum in Dublin. Mm -hmm. And Maher was very impressed with this and uh, encouraged him to... I suppose start writing up his rep reports and that, and uh, mm -hmm. getting them published. 
But Maher himself is an interesting character. Maher was uh, um, head of the Irish, uh, well, the Irish German Nazi Party, which is a bit frowned on to say, I suppose. But um, mm. and I'm sure uh, members of that party. Yeah, yes, really. yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> well, no, and, no. and before Newgrange was actually open to the public, they used to meet Newgrange and there's photographs of them do the Nazi salute and all sorts. Uh, Newgrange, he, he, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was an Austrian born, actually. He was an Austrian born um, um, archaeologist and he was appointed director of the museum by Eamon de Valera. But Byrne became great friends with him and okay. respected his professional uh, mm-hmm. work. And so he's probably, Mar gave him, did he, his first Mar gave research? Mar gave him his first projects. big break, really. And, pu- and published his works then. And, well, he encouraged him to get his work into, 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 into various publications. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, th- I think, well, Byron, from about 1930, he'd been uh, basically, um, he'd, he'd been researching his area and interviewing a lot of the older people and constantly finding these objects, various objects, uh, stone axes and... Uh, um, get, getting them sent into the museum and often the people get a few bob for them that this, if it was on their land and he yeah, negotiated yeah. that and in 1942 uh, I think it was the Ulster Journal of Archaeology they said that thanks to uh, Tom Byrne they had am- amassed a, quite a large collection of material from County Calvin <laughs> so <laughs> he was very keen but uh, in teaching um, also he was a very progressive teacher and he upset the local clergy a lot because um, when he became principal of the yes. modern school in uh, 1950, um, he, he was sort of he was progressive and he decided, look at these smaller schools, they don't have the same quality of education, maybe it's a larger school which might get better funding in that. And he decided to have them shut down. He went sort so of he wanted to shut them down, merge them all into the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so he went behind the scenes to organise meetings and that and right. cause ructions and it made the Irish Times and his letters would answer their letters, the letters of the clergy, and so it was a, you know, it was fascinating. And um, eventually, he got the there was one le- school left in Knockbride, and it closed. Mm-hmm. And he wrote a letter to the Anglo Celt, and he said, uh, "This really underlines uh, the pitiable state of our mm-hmm. s- Church of Ireland schools because this was, it was a Church of Ireland school." And he got it; cl- it was closed. And he, he basically, I thought it was quite a bit of a, you know, he, he was he was a, he was a Church of Ireland. Uh, uh, man himself right. at that time yeah. and uh, I thought that he actually really <laughs> he wasn't he could be quite strong I suppose controversial yeah. really controversial but um, he was really pro, pro progressive and the idea was that the, his school the model school would, would be the leading would, would be a yeah. leading school and he felt, you see, he felt the smaller schools the the didn't have the same emphasis maybe or same equipment and stuff that they would have had like in the model school he he put his own money into buying an atlas which showed that it sort of marked out areas which was a really modern atlas and um, yeah. slides which uh, we played on a projector he had lots of modern equipment and so he's probably felt a very good teacher he's a I'm good sure, teacher yeah. yes yeah and they said uh, they say on a friday afternoon when he was teaching that um he'd uh, show slides from his travels to egypt or greece or wherever and uh, he'd uh, mm-hmm. then get them to go home at the weekend and write an essay on it very well travelled for for somebody like I mean 30 40 50 years yeah. ago you know tr- travel wasn't as popular so N- no would he go no. on these country to these countries to visit museums to visit libraries yes. you know was it purely architectural I, or, and uh, archaeological, archaeological I think, point yeah, of view? yeah yeah i mean like and he brought his poor wife along and i think she she sort of had to um fit in with his plans i remember Actually, museum after museum, yeah, I'm sure yes, she was yeah, thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> Egypt, Greece, uh, Norway, uh, Scotland, and actually there was uh, an itinerary for one of his trips to Scotland, and he mm-hmm. had planned out. I think it was predate predate the, the stay before he'd actually gone on the on the journey, mm-hmm. and he had all planned out the amount of fuel he'd use, the miles he'd travel, how long the boat would take to get over, and right down to which museum he'd visit and what time he'd spend there. And uh, oh I think as a, as a sort of a token, I think his poor wife would end up maybe in a photograph beside some ancient uh, artefact or something. <laughs> and uh, I don't think she, she'd she, much she, rather be down the shops. Very, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. I think she'd been you know, further down the, the shops. And she wasn't really into the history at all. But um, very nice, nice person. But she she wasn't really into the history. I think she referred to a lot of his uh, his papers as clutter. <laughs> 
And how long were they married? <laughs> they were married from 1944. Um, she died uh, early. She died in 1978. Mm. They were planning to move to a new home in Virginia when um, she she died from cancer. Uh, mm. And uh, that's detailed in the book. And I actually uh, um, have a, an account of just... Uh, it described her last days and you know what mm. how things were and it was quite sad really you know but when when she died he moved to his new home virginia and he continued his research i think his research almost doubled when he retired um really and he began writing a lot more and uh so no, yeah, you've lists there of, of yeah, within yeah, the book yeah. of um, that, that's, that's correct, yeah. of some of the the research that that yeah. he had undertaken and a lot of yeah. it would be yeah, I mean, you know, on census information, really, and just I know he did cover certain. Yes, uh, well, he covered um, his emigration from Cavan in the nineteenth yeah. century, emigration. Uh, let's see what, I, what else here. Um, uh, the Drum Goon story of seventeen ninety eight. That's an interesting one. Um, King's Court and its locality. Well, I mean, he, 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 uh, sort of a wide coverage of many things, I suppose. Uh, Angie and Carlisle. Oh, she was actually she was a sort of promoted temperance so she did back in her day uh, 1775 to 1864 and is information like that uh, is th- his works like is it available they are available well, they're all available in the library in Cavan here right so there, uh, Johnston Central Library and uh, anybody can come in to look them up uh, or uh, if you're further afield you can email the library and we can okay and what if, if, if they are further afield and want the information or wanted to uh, to, to see it, can that be facilitated? Oh, of course this it works? can. Oh, yes, it can, yeah. yes. Yeah. Now, in the book, I have added uh, a newly discovered piece he wrote, um, which has quite a long title, and it was called The Coming of the Men of the Cross to East Cavan, then known as Sleevegara of the Galenga, of which the capital was Balyakudj in Knockbride Parish, also known as Sleevenagy, the Highland of the Gods, and that's a pretty long title. That's but the title. Actually. That's and I suppose <laughs> if he had lived to edit it or whatever, he may have changed it. But this mm. was a, a piece I discovered. He was also actually said to be writing a book. Um, the whereabouts of the book is unknown. I know that a lot yeah. of his papers went to Trinity College, but the um, the book is a bit of a mystery. Do you know what the book was supposed to be on? It or? was on. Uh, his research in the Knockby Parish. Right. So it was. And um, there's just, um, just what, what we're talking about, I'm just going through this. He actually, he was invited out to conferences all over Europe. He was quite, as you were saying, like you asked me there earlier, he was well travelled. And uh, he, um, one of the people that he became friendly with was Dr. Anne Ross, author mm-hmm. of the Pagan Celts. And she was she had a great reputation. She presented she presented many programs in archaeology, especially Celtic uh, history, mm-hmm. and she did programs for the National Geographic, the BBC. Um, she was out in America doing a lot of work that way. Uh, she met Tom Barron in nineteen sixty nine, and became very good friends with him. And her and her husband mm-hmm. would come to visit him regularly, right up until his his death. And, uh, she worked on research. She had great, she, fa- she had great faith yeah. in in his work, and mm-hmm. uh, she believed that really he was onto something in Knockbride. He felt that Knockbride was a very prominent, and important uh, historical place, and uh, she made a program with him in nineteen seventy, I think seventy seven. It's in the book, mm-hmm. and uh, she left him to organise the whole setting up of that, and. Uh, so he organised that. She had a lot of trust in him. She had a lot of trust in him. She had great faith yeah. in him. But um, the um, the whole thing with the, with Knockbride, um, he identified it as part of an area running from Virginia, you could say, in the direction of Coot Hill and Shercock. <coughs> he identified it as an area known as Sleeve Gara, uh, or the highlands of the cow goddess. The cow goddess was an important uh, ancient god to the, the Celts. And... Uh, mm-hmm. He also identified in Knockbride, he identified an area as uh, Sleeve Tree Naji, the Highland of the Gods. And the Highland of the Gods referred to these gods um, Governor the Smith, Luke to the Right, and Crednacar the Metal Worker. And they were closely associated with Bridge or Bridget, and not the St. Bridget, but the historical Bridget. And he wrote quite a controversial paper in 19. 
90, which was published in the Baileyborg Community Annual, uh, which was owned by, uh, you would have all remembered, Captain James Kelly. And uh, in that paper, he basically says that Bridget had returned to her people in Knockbride. And he found a reference, I think, in the Annals of the Four Man, or no, it was the Annals of Ulster, actually. Mm -hmm. And he believed that this area was strongly associated with her and this, the Highland of the Gods, with their connection to the name also Bridget, and the various wells and the name of the place itself. And also there was a famous stone, the Bridget Stone, which he'd uh, done some research into. And uh, it, it's a funny little bit. Don't be giving away about it too much yeah. now about the book. We, we need people to buy it. I, actually, we have an image of the no book problem. here, um, Jonathan, and we just put that yes. up there. So your book, The Launch of Tomorrow Night. Yes, we've incorporated the, 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 um, the cover into the poster there, if mm -hmm. you like, or the poster into the cover for the launch, yes. So the launch tomorrow, tomorrow at night, seven pm. Seven pm. In the library. In the library and in Baileybor. In Baileybor, the library in, in Baileybor, and everyone welcome. Everyone's welcome, and of course it's a it was an auspicious date, the twenty first of June, a very uh, very much Celtic date. And how and much how much time. is the book? The book um, is retailing at uh, fifteen euros. Fifteen euros, and where is it available from? It will be available uh, in local bookshops, uh, Crown Oak Bookshop. Uh, Cavan Genealogy Centre and also will be uh, available in various uh, outlets uh, um, mm. throughout the county. Perfect. That's great. Listen, the best of luck with the launch. Really Thank appreciate you, you coming in here this evening. Sounds like a lot of research has gone into that book and a lot of history. It has a, well mount, done. a mountain of it. Yeah, I'm sure. We, we, we chased people. Shin Jera on Clore, Community Focus or CavanTV.com by May Arasharish, Jekathin Shahogin or Hug the Clug. That brings to an end tonight's community focused show on cabintv.com. I'll be back again next Wednesday evening at the same time to give you more community related news on cabintv.com. A special thanks to everyone who contributed to the programme this evening. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great week. Slong. So